Hey, this is Raleigh Brown for WXPN Radio, and I'm talking tonight with singer, songwriter, storyteller, and guitar picker, Gamble Rogers. Gamble, thanks for making the time to talk to us this evening. Well, thank you, Raleigh. I think I, I'd first like to ask you something which I've been wondering about for a while um, concerning your storytelling, and that's uh, there's a very distinctive style to your, to your oratory, which <laughs> smacks of the Southern evangelist preacher. <laughs> um, where does it come from? Well, what, what are the... When I was growing up, Raleigh, uh, in high school, I didn't, was kind of a restless boy, and I would uh, lie abed at night, and I wouldn't be able to sleep. My mind would be racing. And at that time, I was already playing music a good deal and, and writing some. And uh, we were disallowed to listen to the radio after a certain length of time in those days, being youngsters. And so I would pull the little table radio over and put it under my pillow. Uh, and I did it simply um, to, ha to have something to listen to because I wasn't sleeping. And I would listen to WCKY and uh, the XERF and Del Rio, Texas, and all those late-night country music shows, if I stayed awake long enough, uh, there was really only one thing on after about 2.30 or 3 in those days on some of those stations, and that was the old uh, fervent, uh, Bible-thumping, fire and brimstone evangelism. And uh, sometimes I would hear that if I stayed awake long enough, but if I didn't, I suppose that uh, <laughs> it irritated my subconscious. Uh, so I was aware of it when I was coming along, and, and quite irrespective of being involved with it from a religious standpoint, you would certainly have to agree, wouldn't you, that it is a tremendously fervent and expressive Form of communication, communication. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So I've been fascinated with it for a long time. Uniquely American and, and indigenous. Mm -hmm. Do you feel at all that it that it's? Um, I know that in in performing before audiences, I'm sure that at some point in your career you've had to play for audiences who aren't particularly interested in listening, say in bars and stuff. And do you feel that taking a persona like that instead of your own? A uh, mild-mannered persona helps you get across to an audience of that kind, or makes it easier on you internally to to do that. Well, you know, I've never really thought of myself as having a persona, particularly. I've thought of that evangelistic uh, mode of communication as as being simply that—a mode of communication or a technique used to take charge. In the beginning, certainly, it was to take charge or to dominate uh, raffish situations in which I found myself, because in the early days in Florida and Georgia, the only uh, venues in which I had to perform were uh, honky-tonks and uh, skull orchards, we called them, little uh, bars and things. And, and uh, the people who frequented these uh, dead falls were not particularly interested in listening to southern gothic art songs and and guitar solos so when they got out of hand I would start I began to expand the introductions to my stories and fall back on my very uh, natural uh, bent for uh, ha having fun with words so the inevitable occurred, of course. The introductions were expanded to the point where I was talking about characters, and then the, the uh, characters began to recur from uh, introduction to introduction, and then the introductions became monologues, and, and then they got kind of structured into a continuum. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that uh, over the years, like say in the difference between your first album and your second album, um, it seems like on the second album there's a lot more stories and less music. Do you feel that uh, storytelling has become more your mode of communication than singing? 
I am uh, often perceived, and certainly in some venues and forums, as being a storyteller. I've, I've begun to perform at a good many storytelling festivals, for instance. And in some fine arts symposia in universities where I'm called upon to, to uh, uh, come across as a storyteller, I don't see myself as any less of a musician. I, uh, after all, have been playing now for 35 years, and I still uh, play every day that I can. I love it. It's a continuing passion. And uh, there was a while there, I think, when I uh, strayed somewhat away from the music and and went in the direction of storytelling, but I'm beginning to work more music back into what I do so that the music itself becomes a, an underlying denominator to the uh, words. Mm -hmm. um, concerning what you said about your natu natural desire to play with uh, words, have you ever thought of, I mean, it's very obvious to the listener that you have a real strong command of the language. Have you ever thought of writing prose of any kind? Well, uh, when I dropped out of, uh, I went to college for three and a half years, and I had a <laughs> very checkered academic career. I had a year in architecture and a year in history and a year in philosophy, and then a half year in creative writing and classical arts and letters and uh, the English drama and the American novel and so forth. The, the last semester was gloriously self-indulgent. <laughs> uh, and I did, I violated the Protestant work ethic because, you know, when I went to school as a freshman, I somehow felt that it was uh, morally suspect to do anything that I really enjoyed doing, and therefore, for any course of study to have inherent value, it should be onerous and troublesome uh, and something of an affliction to my spirit so I could struggle with it. And after about three years, uh, I finally went out in a blaze of self-indulgence <laughs> and, and uh, found that that balanced the educational proceeding off very well. So, uh, But for you, writing has never been something you've taken off on? Have you ever sat down at the typewriter for a couple of weeks and seen what came out? Well, right after this spate of self-indulgence that I just described, I was uh, emboldened to uh, commence writing a novel. and I, I wrote about 60 or 70,000 words. I worked at it for four or five months, I suppose, and then one direful morning I got up and decided to review what I had re uh, written. And all day I read and I was astonished to find that I had created the predictable autobiographical <laughs> First novel. <laughs> yes, and uh, that was the predictable part, but uh, the, the uh, dreadful part was that the protagonist of this work was uh, a stultifying dullard. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that I was trying to project myself into some sort of a fantasy situation, you know so that I was trying to, to uh, create some vision of myself that uh, can only be arrived at through the experience of life and living. And so I decided to go out and uh, live a little bit and then come back to have the writing of a novel, perhaps. And so I went down to Miami, Florida, and got a job as a Bible salesman, a door-to-door -door Bible salesman. <laughs> and buddy, <laughs> that's when I started living. <laughs> uh, selling Bibles in Hialeah and Miami Springs and uh, uh, meeting just an incredible range of uh, marvelous idiosyncratic 
characters mm -hmm. and people from all walks of life and and of course I was playing music all the time uh, at home at night and for a long time that's the way it went with me I, music was something that I did when I had done what I had to do so also, and also I'd sneak away to do it and that that uh, put a, a, a great luster on it, or I should say, cast a glamour over the music itself because it was Illicit stolen. in some way. Yes. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, let's talk a little about your guitar playing. And I, I was interested to see um, in your liner notes on album number one, the uh, your list of influences of Merle Travis and Chet Atkins and such, which, which shows up beautifully in your style. <laughs> um, but I was curious about the names that I didn't recognize, Will McLean, Paul Champion, and Dale Kreider. Who, who were they? Well, these are Florida artists. Will McLean is the Black Hat Troubadour uh, and the folk laureate of Florida. And uh, he's a, a brilliant poet and a singer. Uh, Pete Seeger once invited Will McLean to sing with him at Carnegie Hall, and Will went and, uh, and floored the folks in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, Dale Kreider is an environmentalist, uh, a man who has deep ecological awareness. In fact, he works for the Florida Freshwater uh, Fish and Game Commission. Uh, he's known in some circles as, as the singing warden. <laughs> Uh, and he writes uh, beautiful folk and bluegrass flavored songs that celebrate the Florida wilderness, which I love. I grew up in the, the swamps and on the rivers and fishing and hunting and camping and, mm -hmm. and uh, canoe camping and that sort of thing. Paul Champion uh, was the first person I ever saw who really made music on a stringed instrument and for whom music was a way of life. He had come from Arlington, Virginia, where he uh, learned bluegrass in that, that crucible of bluegrass music in the Washington, D.C., Maryland area. Mm -hmm. And he was a student of people like Buzz Busby, uh, an appreciator of Scott Stoneman and the Stoneman family. And he finally was one of the earliest bona fide protégés of Earl Scruggs and Don Reno. Wow. As a teenager, he, he made it his business to cultivate not only friendship from these giants of bluegrass music, but respect as well. And they took him around on their buses. He toured with them and even played uh, uh, duets with them and personal appearances on some rare occasions. But uh, he he's a wonderful artist. Uh -huh. Are these people who are still playing in yes. Florida? Yes. Uh huh. Great. Um, wh how long have you? You said you've been playing the guitar for thirty-five years. When you first learned how to play, what music did you listen to, and what did you, what did you really like? Did well, you start right in listening to Merle and Chet? Stuff no, like that? I I learned the ukulele first in about nineteen forty-nine or fifty, and my father taught me. And my father had gone uh, to an Ivy League school, and he had a a repertoire of what we call party songs. Mm -hmm. Things like Way Down in Daytona, I Met Sweet Ramona and a Cute Little Dancer Was She. Uh -huh. She threw her bolero way up in the air, oh, oh boy, what that girl did to me. <laughs> <laughs> that and a boob in Adam, May His Tribe Increased, da -da -da -da, and uh, a capital ship for an ocean trip. Party songs yes. from uh, college in the 1920s, and he taught me all those songs. And and I, my, he taught my brother as well, and we would be trotted out as children during my parents' uh, cocktail parties, and we would perform these songs, and sometimes we sang things we didn't really understand. <laughs> and, 
uh, <laughs> uh, much to the delight of the, uh, the uh, assembled guests. So that's the way I started out. And then uh, after I'd played the ukulele and then the baritone ukulele, just using uh, felt picks, uh, you know, in a kind of a plectrum, ukulele yes. style. I was ill one day, and my mother stopped by the record store, and and she wanted to buy a surprise to cheer me up. And the salesman said, "Well, Mrs. Rogers, uh, here's something that uh, your son will enjoy. It's a record by a hillbilly, but he's sophisticated." <laughs> And so she brought home an album called, and I mean an album, it was... Uh, five records in a... Five in records a, in a, a book form, yeah. uh, format, entitled Merle Travis Sings Folk Songs of the Hills. And I remember my father, who is an immensely discriminating uh, critic of art, mm -hmm. uh, who was a wonderful piano player in his own right, could have been a professional had he wanted to be, but chose to play for fun always, uh, who played in the mode of Frankie Carl, if you remember uh, Frankie Carl's piano playing, a very, very fine piano player. Uh -huh. And my father played things like Nola and Kitten on the Keys yeah. very well. Uh, and he uh, equally loved classical music, Heifetz and Paderewski and, and so forth. I remember my father listening to Merle Travis play uh, Muskrat and John Henry and I Am a Pilgrim, cocking his head and saying, well, Buckshot, he called me Buckshot, he said, uh -huh. well, Buckshot, uh, that's improvisation. I said, but that's good improvisation. Well, those guys really know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it wasn't until much later that he found out that there weren't two people <laughs> playing. Well, it was just right. one. But of course, I certainly thought there were two people <laughs> right. playing. And, uh, of course, a lot of other people did, too. Yeah. So I, I think that uh, listening to those early Merle Travis songs really influenced my approach to folk music. Uh, I'd been exposed to my father's party songs, and they were novelties. Mm -hmm. But here comes Merle Travis singing about social problems and heroics. John Henry being a, 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 a great American hero of, of epic proportions, and 16 tons being a, um, a, a song of uh, at least mild protest. It certainly yeah. had social implications. Mm -hmm. But the thing that always set Merle Travis apart was the fact that he sang with a grin. He sang with a chuckle in his voice. Uh -huh. He was lighthearted, and there was there was good humor in everything he did, and that made a tremendous impression on me that music should be something that you have fun with. Mm -hmm. Now, you can say all sorts of serious things, but you shouldn't just, well, if you want to draw the implication, you would, you would say that uh, you shouldn't set out to polemicize yeah. or to reform or anything like that. But... Uh, yeah, I'm sure if, if one listens to a lot of what is called topical music today, uh, um, the more self-serious it is, the harder it is to take a lot of times. Because well, often the point is lost in a to anyone except another polemicist. You know? mm -hmm. Well, uh, then of course I heard Chad Atkins very quickly, and that, and that was just all over. Uh -huh. <laughs> How did you go about learning that style? Did you uh, listen to the record and uh, pick your brains out, or? Well, I did, and uh, did you ever have any formal music education? No, I didn't, and I didn't have any. There was absolutely no one around me that uh, played this kind of music. Um, my father had taught me a form of boomstrom 
or a pluck pinch, pluck pinch mm -hmm. type of playing in which I plucked the upbeat and then pinched, you know, on one string, the bass string, and then yeah. pinched. Uh, yeah, the, like the blind play piano three style. Top strings, yes, yeah. kind of a pianistic left hand kaboom, pianistic boom, style. Kaboom. What we call boom strum uh -huh. you know, on the guitar, <laughs> or oompa, or boom chop. <laughs> yeah. Well, I learned to to pluck a baritone ukulele with my fingers, and then when I um, had a guitar put in my hands, and I was taught by a man who was in the music department of Rollins College, and his name was Peter Graham Swing, and he was a guitar hobbyist and a, a serious musician. I think he played the cello mm -hmm. or the viola. Uh, and he taught me bass runs, and I was captivated with the guitar, and I transferred all of the baritone ukulele chords uh, to the guitar and just uh, became a closet guitarist. And I played, I'd play after school. Uh, I'd play in the bathroom at home, which was tile, and the acoustics were incredible. Sometimes for two hours, they were men out there hollering, get out of there, get out of there. <laughs> Let us in. Uh, and so I transferred the, the, uh, the little pluck pinch figure that I had used on the baritone ukulele to the guitar, and, and then I had the bass runs, mm -hmm. and then I, I got a thumb pick in a music store, and that, of course, I went from bare finger to the thumb pick. Mm -hmm. And then I learned to play inversions, and I uh, learned to play all up and down the neck just by trial and error. Um, and. <laughs> Somehow, over 35 years, it all comes together. No, you see, now this was all, this went uh, for about five years. And then when I went to college, I had not yet learned syncopation, mm -hmm. the fundamental Travis Lee. And my first year in college, one of my schoolmates was a man named Paul Kraft, who played marvelous Atkins and Travis take off guitar. He played the whole Travis canon and the whole Atkins canon. Uh -huh. And he said, well, you know all these chords, but you, you just ought to do this. And he showed me <laughs> the little Travis lick. And the light went on over and your the head. the light just there, it <laughs> went on, it exploded. Um, and so there you are. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Now, interestingly enough, when I was in Nashville about in 1976, I walked into the Glazer studio and there was a quiet, mild-mannered fellow sitting there at the control console, and it was Paul Kraft, whom uh -huh. I hadn't seen for 12 years. Uh -huh. And he was down there just, he had owned a music store in Memphis in the interim, he had been writing, and he was just down there hanging out and doing uh, bit work in the studio and he subsequently had a, a wonderful career as a songwriter he's written hits from mm, it's Bobby interesting Bear. when you mentioned his name it sounded like vaguely familiar but I don't know if it well if it he was wrote an estimable song entitled Jesus gonna kick me th kick you through the gold oh. post of life <laughs> well, then that's uh, but he's, he's written other things too. he's written a lot of uh, interesting novelties uh-huh mm. When you're uh, when you're not performing, I'm sure that playing and, and writing and all that is a big part of your life. Is there something else that's real big in your life, some other creative outlet that you really enjoy doing that takes you away from music totally? Well, canoeing. Uh huh. Sure. Um, we we like to camp. We like to canoe. Uh, we've got a couple of kayaks, and we live on the water, on the salt water in St. Augustine, Florida, behind a barrier island, and and uh, we get out on the water quite a lot. And we've got an active family life. We have five children and two grandchildren. Mm -hmm. uh, and most seasons we have a garden. I don't think we'll have one this year. Huh. So there's a lot to do.
Uh huh. Does it? Um, do you manage to um, do a decent job of balancing traveling against family life? Um, get better at it as you get older. When Nancy and I got the house and and settled in there in St. Augustine. Uh, I decided that I uh, was surely a genteel schizophrenic because I loved the work. I had toured for years, but I, I equally loved what our place represented. And so I was very fortunate in being able to, to approach the person that I work with, Charles Stedham and tell him that I would like to commute and, and, and that from that time on I would like to spend half of the time at home and half the time out on the road. Since about 1976 I've uh, commuted every week. I go out even if I have to go to Vancouver and play and then I come back home. So I'm out half the time, home half the time. It doesn't work out quite that neatly. I might go out for four days and be home three. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I go out two and I'm home five. Sometimes I go out five and I'm home two, but, but it averages out. And now that uh, the youngsters are uh, grown and spreading their wings while we travel together. Uh -huh. uh, we were in Chicago for a month over Christmas. I was playing a theater club up there and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it can be done, and I would certainly encourage younger people who are going into music, uh, uh, when their heart tells them uh, that uh, they would like to promote that aspect of their lives that has to do with the nesting instinct, that it can be done, and it's eminently gratifying to do it. I'm with you. Well, um, I think we'll bring this to a close since you probably have to go on stage any minute. Thanks very much for talking with us. I've enjoyed <laughs> it a lot. Really.